It's time for us to begin our morning worship. We're glad that you're here. Hope everyone had a good week and uh, hope we can uh, praise our God today in spirit and in truth together. We'll sing uh, number 213 this morning as our opening song and then uh, Zach will lead us in our opening prayer this morning. 213. bow with me. Dear Father in heaven, Father, we come to your prayer this time. Father, just thanking for another day you have given us, for another opportunity to come here this morning to worship you, to sing these songs of praise, to lift our voices up to you. Father, we just ask that you would be with us this morning as we go through our worship service, that everything that is said and done may be pleasing according to your will. Father, we ask you to be with Bob this morning as he leads us in our singing, help us to um, to sing along with him and to sing from the heart, to lift our voices to you and uh, be with um, men who are leading our service today, be with them and um, be with the one bringing the lesson this morning that we could be attentive and to um, listen to the message and to apply it to everyday lives, to be better Christians and examples to the ones around us. Father, be with the ones that we mention in our prayer list each time we meet. Be with the ones who are mourning a loss of loved ones at this time. And please be with them. Comfort the families. Be with the ones who are struggling with their health this time. Please be with them. Comfort them and 
be our will, they could return back a portion of their health to them. Father, we ask you, please just continue to watch and care of us, be with us throughout this service, be with the ones who are uh, joining along with us who are not here this morning. If it be our will, Father, that we'd all be able to join here again here in the near future. You'd please be with the ones who are being affected by the virus and their families, that this can be able to come to a end and we can get back to a more normal life. Please be with the leaders of our country. Please be with them and the decisions they make that be um, best decisions for the ones here in our country. Be with the uh, leaders throughout the world that can come to peaceful resolutions and uh, make godly decisions, Father. Continue to be with the men and women overseas and uh, throughout this country who are um, defending our freedoms and uh, fighting for our country, Father, please be with them. If it be your will, they could return back to their families and keep them safe. Again, Father, we just ask you to be with us now. Go with us. God guard, direct us, and forgive us from any sins we commit. So ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Next song is number 841. Following this selection, uh, Brother Henry will uh, read the scripture for us this morning. If the
Isaiah chapter 6, verses 4 through 8. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe well is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Good morning. So glad to be able to come together and to worship with you this morning, and we pray that our time spent together in God's word will be encouraging and beneficial. God is good all the time. I love the changing of the seasons. Now, you can already say, Ernie, I don't want to hear about that snow word. I'm not talking about snow. Fall is by far one of the most beautiful times of year, watching the trees change and being able to watch and just watch God's beauty and God's creation change before our very eyes. We've been studying with me on Sunday mornings a series of lessons entitled Scent. And we've looked at numerous different individuals so far. So far, I believe, if my numbers are correct, we've looked at four, and today will be the fifth. We've looked at a man named John the Baptist as one crying in the wilderness, one that was proclaimed and one that was prophesied about by the man we're going to speak about this morning. We also looked at Ananias, a man that was sent by God to speak to Saul of Tarsus, the man who was ravaging the church, the man who was destroying, if you will, trying to put an end to the beginning of Christianity as we know it today. But we later find that his life was changed through his meeting with Jesus on the road to Damascus, as well as meeting with Ananias. And then the last two that we've looked at here recently had been Moses. Someone who was sent by God, but someone who yet wanted to make excuses, wanted to make reasons, have thoughts or purposes why he couldn't be sent by God. Because he wasn't an eloquent speaker. And why? Because he he just wasn't good enough. He wasn't going to be able to stand. What am I supposed to say? So he had purposes or excuses, if you will, as to why he couldn't be sent by God to do his work. And then we looked at Samuel here two weeks ago. Samuel and his life being used, a blessing from God to his mother. And she said, all the days of his life, he will serve you. I will lend him to the Lord so that he can be used. And in all of these cases and in all of these situations, they all said, here am I. Here am I, Lord, use me. Unfortunately, sometimes when we say, here I am, Lord, use me, sometimes we get a little nervous because he's going to use us in ways that make us uncomfortable, or he's going to ask us to do something that takes us out of our comfort zone, and it's going to push us and press us to realize that it's not me who's in control, it's not me who's doing the work, but it's God that's working through me. And the individual that we're going to look at this morning, I believe, is an incredibly powerful individual. And what we're going to study this morning is not even going to begin to honestly touch the tip of the iceberg about what you read throughout the rest of the book. Because as you read throughout the rest of the book, you find the power that is in Isaiah's word, the prophet. Now, I know that these images that I place up here aren't really images of those individuals. They're just supposed to be a a semblance of them. But Isaiah, I believe he was one who, when he spoke with God, without question, had incredible reverence for God, towards God, and he was dedicated to doing the purpose of God. And what we read here this morning as we studied and Brother Henry read for us, Isaiah's humble beginnings, when you can read here through the first five chapters or so, he knew what his purpose was because he had saw or he had seen the people of Israel and he saw their behaviors. He knew where their hearts were and they weren't towards serving God. They weren't towards loving God. They weren't towards obeying God. And people might say, well, Looking at our society today, I believe our society is in that same place. Church society has always been in that place because they've always wanted to feed themselves, take care of themselves, serve themselves. It's a concentrated effort 
to be someone who can humbly go before God and say, here I am, Lord, send me, use me, because the world is exactly that. If we go back all the way to the time of Noah, I mean, let's be honest, when Noah was sent into the world, there were eight in the entire creation of the world at that time that found favor and pardon in the eyes of God before he destroyed that world. And Isaiah, in the first five chapters, acknowledges the shortcomings. He acknowledges the godlessness that's going on. And when you pick up here and you start reading what he writes, I want us to notice a few things. The first thing is that Isaiah is being sent to bring about change. Now, you may say, Warney, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? That's what each of the people that we've talked about so far have been sent to do, right? Bring about change. Maybe you'll even use the term, they're being sent to redirect people, to send them back to God. Not to take them back in a different way, not to take them in an alternative way, but to return them to where they came from, from God. Or you might even use the purpose of returning him or returning them to where they originally began. So when you look here at Isaiah, his purpose was to bring change, to redirect the people, and to return them to God. That's what Isaiah's purpose was. And that purpose was found here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had made. This is after the creation of man. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, if we look back at the other five days of creation, we know that at the end of each of those days, God looked at what he had created and he said it was good. But after he had created man, and it says in our likeness or in our image, we created man. He says it was very good. This is where God wants us to be redirected to, to be returned to, to be changed, is to be back to be like him as he created us in his image. And Isaiah here has this incredibly difficult and daunting task to be sent to bring, redirect, and return God's people to him. We pick up here in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood a seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then as Brother Henry began his scripture reading, verse 4, And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. When you go back this, we know that this is a very similar text that we find in the book of Revelation. But I want you to notice verse 1. I want you to consider verse 1 for just a moment. And the way that Isaiah viewed God. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. He says that he looked at him high and lifted up, exalted, setting above everything, setting above everyone. Nothing was above him. Nothing was greater. Nothing was higher than him. And he was sitting on a throne. Now, we all know the one who sits on a throne is the one who's in control, right? The one who sits on the throne is the one who's in charge. The one who sits on the throne is the one who's reigning over. And that's the way Isaiah views and sees God. He sees the glory of God. When he talks there about the seraphims, and it talks about the voices of those crying out. I mean, that had to be an incredibly powerful moment that would have taken all of our breaths away to see God exalted and highly lifted up. But is that the way we approach God when we come to worship? It's more than just a Sunday fling, as I heard in a song I was listening to this morning. Coming to worship God is so much more than just something we do flippantly on Sundays. This isn't something that's a social gathering. This is coming for us to highly exalt and to acknowledge the glory and the power of God. And that's the way Isaiah saw God. Is that the way we see God? Because when you continue to look at it, 
Look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5. One of the verses that shows us humility, shows us a lot about the character, about who Isaiah was. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me. Sounds a little bit to me like what we read about the Apostle Paul writing in Romans chapter 7. He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Or when he calls himself and refers to himself as the chief of sinners. Not because Paul looked at himself as being a pathetic excuse for a human being, but he acknowledged the greatness of God, the power and the glory of Jesus Christ, and understood where he ranked up against him. Or maybe when we turn to Psalm chapter 103, and we look there in verse 14, that he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. We were formed out of the dirt of the ground, the dust of the ground. That's where we're going to return. And Isaiah here says, I am a man for I am undone. Now, we try to do ourselves up pretty well for Sundays, right? We try to make sure we look nice and presentable, right? If I were to show up to your house or you were to show up to my house middle of the week chances are you wouldn't see me wearing a shirt and tie and nice dress shoes mess shorts t-shirt maybe right or if we've been out working in the yard you might consider that to look undone it's not what he's talking about here he's talking about acknowledging that he has fault acknowledging that he has mistakes acknowledging that he is a part at some time in the world Just as we in our lives, we've sinned, we've been around the unclean lips of the world, we've fallen into the world, I dwell in the midst of people, but we're called to be a light on the hill, Matthew chapter 5. We're called to be the one who lets our light shine before man, so that they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father which is in heaven, in the midst of all of this. And then you go on to read what it says following, was what Brother Henry read for us that his lips were cleansed, his life was cleansed. Humility, church. Isaiah approached God in humility to find out where he would be sent to be used as God wanted him to. And when this is what we know about humility, according to Jesus, it says God opposes the proud, but graciously cares for the humble. That's what God desires from us. That's what Jesus desires from us, to have humility, to be humbled. And that's the way that Isaiah approaches God. And when he makes that statement of, and I heard God ask, who will I send? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. This morning, if God was to ask us, if he was to sit here in our midst, or if we were to hear his voice speak to us, and he would ask, who will I send? How many of us this morning are willing to raise our hands and say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Isaiah knows the people of Israel. He knows their situation. He knows their godlessness. And when we read here the rest of this chapter in chapter 6, it's almost a feeling of hopelessness. It's literally a feeling of hopelessness that he would be going into. Because God sets the stage for how Isaiah is going to go and what the initial outcome is going to be when Isaiah goes to be sent by God to try to return people to the way. Maybe in our lives we think we already know what the outcome is going to be. Kind of like Jonah, who didn't want to go to Nineveh. Why? Because they're not going to listen to me, God. They're not going to change their way, God. They're not going to hear the words that are coming from my mouth from your will, God, so I'm going to turn and go where I want to go, and I'm not going to follow your way. Now, I understand that we're talking about Isaiah, but I want you to think about it. Isaiah and Jonah have a lot of commonalities in that 
aspect that they're being sent to do a difficult task. And what we're going to find this morning is that the difference between Jonah and Isaiah, Jonah tried to flee from God, tried to run away from being sent by God. Isaiah had a totally different perspective on how he was going to be sent to be used and how he was going to serve the Lord. Let us go to God in a word of prayer as we begin our study. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. Father, the cool, crisp air this morning that we have to, to be able to get up and to feel your glory and to feel your majesty, to be in your creation. Father, the beautiful sunshine that you have sent our way. Father, this past week we were able to see the power that is in your creation through some of the rain, through some of the wind. Father, we're able to look around us every day and to be able to see your glory and your love. Father, as we surround you this morning, as we open up your word to study, as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, as we enter into moments of prayer to speak with you, to plead with you, to petition with you, may we never forget that you are holy, 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 that you are the Lord of hosts, you are the Lord of all. May we, with humility, approach your throne. May we, this morning, allow ourselves to see that the barriers that are in our lives to be sent to do your work are the barriers that we place in our lives, Father, not the barriers that you place in our lives. Father, this morning we pray that if there's someone here who's not a Christian, that they'll understand that you're calling them to follow you, that you're calling them to serve you, you're calling them to obey you, and may they never think for a moment that they're too far gone to be saved. Father, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we pray that this morning, if someone's heart is right, if they see the absence of you in their lives, they see the need for salvation and forgiveness, Father, that they'll come to you. Father, if there are brothers and sisters in Christ who are struggling, who are hurting, who have lost their way, who feel like they're taking on more than they can handle, that they need the prayers of the church or they need to return back to you, Father, that they need to have their lives redeemed, their path straightened, their lives covered by your grace and your mercy. Father, we pray that this morning they'll make those needs known, whether here in our assembly or in their homes. Father, the grace and the mercy and the love and the patience that you show toward each and every one of us. Father, we're so thankful for the forgiveness that you show and that you're willing to give each and every one of us when we allow our hearts to be cleared and serving you. Father, remove the stains of sin from our lives so that we with you one day may be together in heaven. Father, this is our prayer as we study your word this morning that will be encouraged, that will be convicted, and that will be changed to be sent by you, to be used by you, to be your servant, to be an example to the world, Father, and to love you as you have loved us. And it's in your son's name we do pray, and amen. Here I am. Three simple words, incredibly difficult to do, much easier said than done. And when you begin looking here in Isaiah, the rest of the sixth chapter, I want you to look at these few verses with me. He says, and he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Now, when you read that and you look at verse 9, you would think to yourself, well, that, that sounds a little contradictory maybe. Go and tell this people. That's the first thing Isaiah is told after he says, here I am, Lord, send me. God says to him, go. 
That's what we're told by Jesus, right? That's what we look at there at the end of Mark chapter 16, verses 14, 15, and 16, I believe. And what we find in Matthew chapter 28, 18, 19, and 20, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go and share the good news. Go and teach people what I've commanded you and everything that I've commanded you. And now you have Isaiah the prophet here hearing from God, go and tell this people. Now there's two things I took from that. First of all, the direction. Second of all, the way God uses people now. He doesn't say, go and tell my people. What did he say? Go and tell this people. They must have turned their lives so far from God that he's not referring to them as his people right now, but he's referring to them as this people. Have you ever had somebody look at you and instead of calling you by name said, you all or you people, you people over there in that building, or you people that live over there. I take that as an insult, to be honest with you, when I hear people say that. I have clients sometime at work, when they get upset about being addressed about something, they always say, well, you people here, and it burns through me like a hot knife through butter. I hate it. I despise it. Because being referred to as you people, I'm like, I got a name. You know who I am. But I want you to think about the way they must have been living their lives. For God to say, go, Isaiah, and tell this people, this people, where their lives had gone so far from following his will. And then you notice he says, keep on hearing, but they don't understand. Keep on seeing, but you do not perceive. Now take that and place that in the New Testament. Jesus comes and shares the good news, right? People listened, right? Not everybody obeyed. People saw his marvelous works. They saw his miraculous miracles and the healing that he did. They saw it, but they didn't perceive it. They didn't change them. It didn't alter their paths. That doesn't mean that Jesus still wasn't sent. That doesn't mean that Moses still wasn't sent. And they saw all those 10 plagues in Egypt then they saw the parting of the Red Sea. They saw the Red Sea crash down around Pharaoh and his army. They saw it. They heard it. And yet they always found a way to find complaints about what God wasn't doing for them. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see and hear and understand and return and be healed. When you read that, it's almost like Isaiah is going to go beat his head against a brick wall because it doesn't make a difference what he says. It doesn't make a difference what he does. They're not going to change. But yet he's told by God, go and tell this people. It's kind of like this, church. They understood, but they refused to apply application. Does that fit us in our lives at all? That we hear, we know, we understand. I'm just not going to do it. Reminds me of what you find here in Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 and 6. Then he spoke about, he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. The seeds were planted. They just refused to hear. They refused to apply. They refused to listen. Church, there was no return for them. Not because they couldn't, but rather, church, because they wouldn't. When we go into all the world and we share the good news, the gospel, the teachings of Jesus, the will of God, we plant that seed. If there is no return on that seed, it's not our fault if we do the will of God. It's not our fault when someone rejects God because they're not rejecting you, however it feels like it, right? It feels like when they say no to wanting to obey the gospel or they say, no, I don't want to, or no, I choose not to, 
You feel rejected because you feel that you've delivered it all and there's no return on it and you feel like you're doing something that's in vain. You feel like you're wasting your time. When you go to Isaiah chapter 29 and you read down through there, Isaiah feels that way, but he knows the promise of God. Isaiah feels at times that he's not getting everything. They're not doing what he wants or what he's instructing them that God wants from them. And he feels there's no return. Church, but God says go and tell the people. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He doesn't say go and life will be easy. It'll be simple. Everyone will hear you and want to tell you. You may have family members that you've shared the good news of the gospel with and they've rejected it time and time again. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. And we know how he changes our lives. Sometimes when we're sent, there's not going to be a return on our labor. We're not going to see that great redeeming reward right then and there. Maybe later in life. But that doesn't mean that we don't go. That doesn't mean that Isaiah didn't go. Because Isaiah went. And this is the church, the part where it shows the difference between Jonah and Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 11. Then I said, Lord, how long? He was told, you're going to go. They're not going to listen. They're not going to hear. They're not going to perceive. They're not going to understand. They're not going to change. Isaiah says, okay, Lord, how long am I going to do this? He doesn't say, well, then why am I wasting my time? He asks God again, how long do you need me to do this? How long do you want to send me? How long will I be gone? How long will I continue in this work? Because Isaiah wasn't about fleeing or turning away when it wasn't going the way he would have hoped. He was more a church rather about the obedience. He says, God, here I am, send me. And then when God tells him what he needs to do, he says, okay, God, how long do I need to do this? How long do you want my service on this, Lord? Is that the way we approach being sent? Okay, God, your timetable, not mine. Your process, not mine. Your thought, your ways, not mine. Your will, not mine. That's the way Isaiah approached God. He saw him high and lifted up. He saw him exalted. He was hum humbled before God. He had humility. And he says, God, use me. Use me for me, your work, Lord. And then we find in verse 13, Church, I want to be honest with you, this is the moment where you can take a little bit of encouragement. But yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming. And a terebinth tree or an oak whose stumps remain when it is cut down so the holy shall see or so, so, so the holy seed shall be its stump. He says it's not going to be for all worthlessness. It's not going to be without return. There are going to be those who will return, Isaiah. There will be that small percentage that will come and they will return to my way. It says most of them will not because he says, but yet a tenth will be in it. Tenth, 10% 10 approximately, 90% will never change. But tenth, how willing are we to not worry about the percentages. People all the time ask, and I've heard people ask the question, well, well, how many people were baptized when you went and did this missionary work? Or how many people came back to the Lord? And sometimes people will say, we had one or two. And I've heard people before say, well, that's not a whole lot of return on all of that investment. Who put a price tag on a soul? Who said that works only worth that amount of money, if we get 25 people to respond, or if we go out to a High Valley Christian youth camp and we only have one person that's baptized out of 90 kids, did we really do a good work? One soul was saved from the world. One soul came to know Jesus. One soul was redeemed from eternal loss. What price tag are you going to put on that? 
Isaiah saw the value in going and doing God's work. And that's what he did. He says, how long do I need to do this, Lord? What do you need out of me? Here I am. Send me, Lord. Send me so that I can make a change. Send me, Lord, so that I can redirect people, your people, to come back to you so that they may find their way back to you and they may be returned to you, O Lord. Lord, here I am. Send me. Even in the midst of a difficult, trying time, church, are we willing to take the stand and say, here I am. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Isaiah, when you read the book, is preparing the way. Preparing the way for what Jesus will become, who Jesus is, the Messiah that's going to come. And he prepares the way by letting them know that he's going to be rejected just as you have rejected God. He's going to be marred for your sins. He's going to be beaten for your transgressions. He's going to be murdered because of your willingness to not follow God. Isaiah is an incredible individual that we can look at and see sent into a difficult situation to redeem people from the lost world back to God. This morning, in our difficult and trying times, are you still willing to be sent? Are you still willing to go? Are you still willing to share? Will you tell God, here I am, use me? This morning, if you're outside of Christ and you've not put him on a baptism, you've heard the word of God, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Not just believe it, but believe it and want and realize that it needs to be in your life, that it needs to change you, it needs to mold you, it needs to shape you to be the one that he wants you to be. Are you willing to put yourself off and allow him to become the primary focus in your life? Are you willing to follow, to serve, to love? Are you willing to commit? Are you willing to be a servant to the one who's promised eternal life? If you have, then repent of your sins. Confess him as your Lord and Savior and be baptized this morning for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're a Christian who needs to come home, we're praying for you. We will pray with you. We will pray for you. We'll do anything we can to support you in reuniting you in your walk with God. This morning, will you say, here I am, God. Use me. If there's any way we can help you, we encourage you to come while we stand and while we sing. Bring Christ your broken life.
seated, please. I'm going to sing number 203 this morning, I believe the first four verses, and then uh, Brother Charlie will direct our remembrance around the Lord's table. Man of sorrows, what a We are privileged to assemble to worship our God. It is very important for us to remember what God has done for us. I'd like for everyone to get their bread and their fruit of the vine ready to partake. You know, we are, we are forgetful people. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, to a congregation that did not see the crucifixion of Jesus, they did not see the resurrection, but they had heard from eyewitnesses that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he rose again. Remembrance is very important, and we have the bread, we have the fruit of the vine each Lord's Day. May we never forget. Before we partake of the bread, I'd like to read the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters of the gospel I preach to you, the gospel which you received, the gospel in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as of the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. May we never forget. Let us uh, pray, please. Our God, our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for our assembly. Father, we ask that you would accept our assembly as our expression of our love for you. 
We're thankful, Father, for the unleavened bread. And Father, we pray that as we eat of it, that we will remember. Remember the suffering, the death. We'll remember the resurrection. Bless us, Father, as we eat. Help us to remember. May we never forget, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us please eat the bread. Let us pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, again, we love you. We thank you for our assembly. We thank you for these emblems. And now, Father, as we drink of the fruit of the vine, help us to remember what you and your son did for us. Help us, Father, to remember that it cost his blood. Father, we'd ask that you'd bless this fruit of the vine. Bless our remembrance, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us please drink. Also, on the first day of the week, we are privileged in our assemblies to give as God has so richly given to us. Everyone here and every one of our members that are tuned in on Facebook have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a cost to that, and the churches in the collection you know, pay the cost for preaching and, uh, and the teaching that is there in order that we can hear. There are people in our country that have not heard the gospel. We that have heard need to join together so that we can allow the gospel to be sent. Us using our money for this instead of using our money for what we want is good for us. So if, uh, if you're giving here this morning, there's a collection box in the back as you exit the auditorium. You can place your contribution there. If you are tuned in to our Facebook page, uh, please, you can send the contribution to the congregation here at our church address. You can give it to Bill Fisher give it to Bob Swain, uh, but it's important that we do that. Our giving shows our love for our Lord and the greatest mission that he's given. I'd like to uh, read Galatians chapter 6, beginning with verse 6, as we consider our giving. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from his flesh reap corruption, but to the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due seasons we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the creation in which you've placed us in. We exalt you above all that we know. You have blessed us so much with riches and bounty and beauty. You've blessed us with families. You've blessed us with eternal life through your son, Jesus. Father, we ask that you'd be with us as we give, accept our offering today as our expression of love for you. Help us, Father, not to grow weary, but help us to try and do good 
all the days of our lives. Again, Father, we thank you for all that you've given to us. Please receive this collection as our love for you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It's been nice to be here together with everybody. Uh, glad to see everybody online also. I uh, want to continue to worship our Lord in spirit and in truth every day of our lives. Um, as far as announcements this morning, we do want to remember those in need of prayers. We've got Denver Collins, Sandy Collins, uh, Jerry Clem, who has a follow-up appointment in September, uh, Kathleen Holder, recovering from a kidney uh, infection, Justin Abbott, uh, that's Clinton and Susan Knott's nephew, uh, Nathaniel Hall, Bernice McPherson, Harold and Glenna Morrison, uh, doing well, but are both are dealing with health situations. Uh, Connie Ford, that's Brian's mother, has been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Uh, and Dana Rose, uh, son of Gerald Ruth Rose, actually had a liver transplant yesterday that was successful. Um, it was late yesterday. It was a 12 to 16 hour surgery, I do believe, but he is doing as well as can be expected at this point. Uh, so we want to continue to keep him in our prayers. Uh, Denver Horn had appointments for his heart and also for prostate cancer. Uh, he started medication and received his first shot in the Cleveland Clinic, uh, still waiting to find out when they will start radiation. Uh, Vanessa Shoup, that's a 14 year old Warren local student, has suffered a stroke. Uh, Rose Warden, that's Missy Joy's mother, is in need of our prayers at this time. I'll let you read that one for the name. Um, Gavin is going into first grade at uh, Warren Elementary School. Uh, he has been diagnosed with, uh, well, I'll let you read that one too, leukemia and a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, he has a very long road ahead of him. So we'll keep Gavin in our prayers as, as we go on. Uh, are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? All right, if not, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, and then we'll have a closing song. Dear God, our Father in Heaven, we come to you at this time thankful for the ability we have to gather around and to worship you. We pray, Father, as we close this service that everything we've said and done has been found pleasing in your sight, as that is the reason we gather together, is to please you not to please ourselves. We pray, Father, as we leave this building and go out into the world that you be with us and guide us and guard us and bring us back to the next appointed time. We pray that as we are out in the world that we let your light shine that others can see you through us. That we are that example that we need to be for everyone, everyone we come in contact with. Father, we pray for those who are mentioned on the sick list that if it be your will that you return their health to them so they can come back to you. We pray, Father, at this time for those who are spiritually sick that you can help us to be what they need us to be to see the air in their ways. We pray, Father, that you be with the, our country at this time, that the dividing that is going on, that we could come to the realization that everything that is being argued about is, is basically a moot point. We all need to be to you and follow your will. We pray, Father, that you be with us once again as we go out into your creation, the beauty that all around us from you. We thank you most of all, Father, for the love that was shown for each and every one of us that while we were sinners, you sent your son to this earth to be that perfect sacrifice and that he willingly came to be that sacrifice because of the love for us so that we can have that heavenly home with you one day. It is through Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.
We'll sing two verses of this uh, closing song, and then we'll be uh, dismissed. If you would, please stand with me as, as we sing.